On Sicily is presented by Experience Sicily, boutique small group tours and creative travel planning. During On Sicily, Experience Sicily's owner and curator, Alison Scola, shares her passion for Sicily, aiming to inspire your senses through conversations with inviting and knowledgeable locals. Discover 3,000 years of human history, explore the island's fascinating culture and cuisine, and ignite your curiosity about this enchanting region of Italy. Learn more at experiencesicily.com. For more than 25 years, Jacqueline Alio has worked as a certified local guide with a focus on Palermo and its surroundings. She is also an historian who has authored many books and articles about Sicily and Sicilian culture that have been read by millions throughout the world. An expert on the Arab Norman period, more than two decades ago, Jacqueline began to question where were the women in this story of one of Sicily's most significant eras? She found that they were certainly present, and in the case of Margaret of Navarre, her contributions were vital to the continuity of the kingdom, a kingdom where power plays between the multi-ethnic populace, the power-hungry clergy, and the entitled baronial classes were a constant. Already before he was appointed Archbishop of Palermo, people at court uh, started to say, oh, look at Margaret, look at the queen, look at how she's eyeing her cousin, she's having an affair with him. Uh, it was probably not true. Okay, she probably looked at him as uh, a brother or somebody who could really give political and administrative support. In the end, she, it, it got so wild that she ended up having to send him away. <laughs> This is Alison Scola of Experience Sicily. Thank you for joining me for On Sicily. Margaret of Navarre was handpicked by Sicily's Roger II to marry his heir, William. In 1149, at age 15, she left her home in Pamplona, Spain for Palermo. 16 years later, her dying husband named her keeper of the entire realm until their son, William II, would come of age in five years' time. At 31 years old, Margaret was the most powerful woman in Europe and the Mediterranean, and she successfully navigated the Kingdom of Sicily to maintain the progressive constitutional laws her father-in-law, Roger II, had established. Yet until now, historians barely mention her. You've written a book about Margaret, Queen of Sicily, and it's quite a body of work. When did you start researching this topic? Well, I started researching Margaret first just for my own personal knowledge, because I'd go into the Cathedral of Monreale with clients, with guests, and I want to know more about her because so little information is out there. And so about 20 years ago, I started looking for information on Queen Margaret, but there was nothing out there, no books, no biography. And if you think about it, she was a contemporary of a Queen um, Eleanor of Aquitaine, Henry II's uh, wife, and eventually they became consuogere. There, there's no term in English for consuogere, but basically, Margaret's son married Eleanor's daughter, and so they were sort of related. But notwithstanding the fact that there are many biographies written on Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, nothing had been written on Margaret. So we can well say that my book, in the end, it's like I had to go out there and write it. <laughs> my book is the only biography on Queen Margaret in any language the only biography. What was it about her that was so significant? She was queen regent for five years, from 1166 until 1171, when her son, King William II of Sicily, reached the age of majority, which was 17 at the time. And for those five years, if you think about it, she was one of the most powerful women in Europe and the Mediterranean. Sicily at the time, which had been patched together by the Norman Count, King Roger I, and then his son, Roger II. Sicily spanned from south of Rome, including Napoli, the Naples area, all the way down to Calabria. So that's half 
of mainland Italy. It included Sicily, which is it's the biggest island in the Mediterranean. And as you know, uh, it's like a, a, a floating continent, right? Yep. <laughs> it included Malta. Uh, on and off, we had lands in today's Libya and Tunisia that were connected to Sicily and the Balkans, parts of the Balkans. Okay, so Margaret was ruling one of, one of the biggest kingdoms in Europe and the Mediterranean, and it was a multi-religious, multi-ethnic kingdom. So she had subjects who looked up to her, who spoke Arabic, and then a Hebrew language called Judeo-Arabic, because the Jewish populations came from North Africa, and they spoke Judeo-Arabic, sort of like Yiddish, which is, you know, Hebrew and German. In this case, it was Hebrew and Arabic. Then she had a Greek population, originally from uh, Byzantium that then stayed on in Sicily. She had Lombards, people from Lombardy who had migrated like colonists to Sicily to work the lands and live here. And of course, the Normans who mostly spoke French and who were Catholic. So it was a mixed population, different religions, and she was basically a queen. As regent, she was ruling in her son's name. So um, you, you understand it's it was incredible that nobody had written her biography. This is at one of the, the most important periods in the Norman kingdom as well. Exactly. Think of it. Her father-in-law, Roger II, in 1140, had issued a constitution that was set in place during her, son, her husband William's rule and then her, her rule and her son's rule that continued until Frederick II became king and Holy Roman Emperor, it's not like he changed the constitution that his grandfather, Roger II, had set up, but he made it better. The Assizes of Ariano, Roger's constitution, protected religious liberties, it made rape a crime. There were so many rules in there and laws that were able to keep this multicultural, multi-ethnic kingdom together. And, and so she had an actual law system that, that she kept in place and absolute power really amazing. Right. So let's step back a bit. So she was from Spain or what we know as of Spain today. Talk yeah, about no, her, her, her background and why she was chosen because we know that these marriages were all arranged <laughs> to keep the power within the this this high class of people. And, and and to make the kings and queens more powerful. Yeah. Well Margaret was born in the area of La Rioja in Spain near Navarre in a, a town castle called La Guardia. Her father was a king. He started out as a warrior and he worked his way up to become king of Navarre, the Basque region of, of, of Spain, and Pamplona, okay, the city called Irunia by the Basque people that we call Pamplona. People might be familiar with uh, Ernest Hemingway's book, Fiesta, The Sun Also Rises, that's, that's based on the running of the bulls in Pamplona right. in the 1920s. Okay, so that was the capital of her father's kingdom. And if we go back a little bit, her father was the grandson of El Cid. Rodrigo de Vivar had a daughter. He had many children, but he had a daughter by the name of Cristina, who married Garcia Ramirez, is the person who became his, his father. Okay, so Wow, that's quite a pedigree. It was quite a pedigree. And she had a brother called Sanchez, a sister called Blanca, and a half-brother called Rodrigo like like um like El Cid. okay right. now her mother was norman french is that correct right marguerite d'aigle came from across the pyrenees and she, yes she was norman french from the aigle or lego family and a family friend her family was, a, was they were friends with none other than thomas beckett the archbishop oh. of canterbury so here wow. we have the connection with england right okay um so yes yeah, she had quite a pedigree and we could imagine Margaret growing up in Pamplona with her sister Blanca, her brother Sanchez, and her mother tongue must have been French, like her mother, but she also learned Latin and Spanish. Maybe she understood a few words in Arabic because that land had the Moors, and at that time in that area they were living in a per pretty much peaceful way, okay, on and off, as you know. Yes. <laughs> Spain had its issues. 
and she probably learned some some of the Basque language too. Basque people there have been there forever since Neolithic times, and they have their own language. Um, so she grew up in a slightly multicultural society. So at fifteen, she was transported to Palermo, and yeah, exactly. I mean, what um, year are we talking about now? Eleven. Okay, so she was born in 1135, okay. and she was almost 15 when um, an envoy arrived from Palermo, sent by King Roger II, all the way to Pamplona, to Navarre, asking for Margaret's hand. Uh, so yeah, she was quite young. And there was a connection, though. It's, it's a little far, far away. But um, Roger II was somewhat familiar with, with Spain because uh, his first wife was Elvira Elvira of Castile. And she was a Jimenez. So was Margaret because Margaret's father, Garcia Ramirez, was a Jimenez. He was from the Jimenez family. So there was this connection, even though William I, who Margaret married, we can say was like a third cousin, one's removed, or something like that, <laughs> okay? Something far away. So okay. so let's say around 1150, she arrives in Palermo. Roger II, my favorite king, the person Mine I Mine too, family. okay, Allison. <laughs> my hero. <laughs> totally He's my, my hero. hero. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> so she arrives at court in 1150. I can't, tell us what Palermo was like in 1150. Uh, Palermo. The impression of this young woman arriving in Palermo. Sure. Just imagine this. So, so think of it. Palermo um, was one of the biggest cities in in Europe at the time, and the Mediterranean. Under just just before the Normans took over Palermo, there were already about a hundred thousand people living in Muslim Palermo. So during the 10th century, it was like the fourth largest city in the world after Baghdad, Constantinople, and Cordoba in Spain. Uh, China. At the time, 10th century, still didn't have cities bigger than Baghdad. Not uh, 200 years later, that happened, but not at that time. And with the Normans, the city probably did, it didn't double in size, but um, it, it became bigger. We had between 150 or 180,000 people in Palermo, and the Normans were so incredible because they they chose tolerance as opposed to fighting out and killing and forcing everybody to convert to the Catholic Church, they, they embraced tolerance. It was the golden age of Sicily and Palermo in which Muslims, Jews, Greek Byzantine Orthodox Christians and Normans started to live together to prosper. And kings like Roger II, okay, our hero, uh, were um, ruling on the island and in Palermo because Palermo became the capital and people were able, it, it didn't matter what religion you were a part of or what your ethnic background was, what language you spoke, uh, you could have become somebody working in the royal court. You could have become Roger, the king or the queen's treasurer. In fact, the treasury was run by Muslims. You could have become the king's personal or the queen's personal doctor. And that happened with the Jews or the silk weavers. We had Jewish silk weavers. You could have become the teachers of the royal family's children. And all these groups, including the Greek Byzantines, participated at court. So this was the court. Everybody was using their own language. Uh, decrees, laws, information was issued in all the languages that the people spoke. It must have been complicated because at court, sure, Latin was the language in which many charters were written in, but then they were translated into Arabic and Greek and Judeo-Arabic. But at court, Norman French was spoken too. Right. Just like in England. Well I think about this and I wonder, like, would they have been married in the Palatine Chapel? Um, so it seems, okay, we, we don't have the exact, I don't think we actually have the exact site where they were married, uh, because the cathedral, it could have been the cathedral or the Palatine Chapel. Later, when Roger II passed away in 1154, 
Margaret and William were crowned and anointed at the cathedral by the archbishop. Okay. okay. But some of the weddings did take place at the Palatine Chapel, um, like, like, for example, the one in 1177 between um, Margaret's son, William II, and Joanna of England, Eleanor de Aquitaine, and Henry II's daughter. Okay, so these were the two, the two sites at the time where important um, events took place. Right. So William, her husband, he had this triumvirate, right, that he had working with him. And then he died. He had this untimely death. And, the age of 46, right. Right. And his son, who is, what, 12 at the time. 12-year-old William II, who was described as tall, handsome, fair, and he looks like a Norman. That's how he was described at the age of 12 after his father died. What happens? Uh, she becomes queen regent. Queen regent in 1166, but she wasn't alone. Before her husband died, and he died of dysentery, William had appointed two people as counselors, okay, chancellors, uh, called um, Amiratus in the royal court, and that was Richard Palmer, who was English. Richard Palmer was a bishop, and he was English, and a certain um, Matthew of Aiello. Okay, so these two people were giving advice to Margaret, and once she was widowed, she appointed another man to give her a hand. So it became like a, a trio of people, three governors helping the queen command. The third person was not Norman, not Catholic originally. His name was Kaid Peter, who had been a Muslim, and then he converted to the Catholic Church. And he, he, he was um, working in the royal palace, and the queen trusted him 100%. But it started to become very complicated uh, because there, the Norman court, uh, uh, within the court, there were Norman barons who wanted more power. And the bishops and archbishops of Sicily and southern Italy wanted more power in their hands, too. And they didn't like Bishop Richard Palmer because he was considered a foreigner. He was English, not Sicilian. So it got very complicated for Margaret. Right. It sounds like there was a lot of animosity at court towards foreigners, right? Sometimes she was referred to as the Spanish queen. Okay. Right. She was considered an outsider too. It was crazy because it was such a multicultural island, but at the same time, there were these barons and bishops that looked towards some of the people at court and in Sicily as foreigners. It happened on and off. It must have been very complicated. Somebody as strong as Roger II was able to keep the kingdom together uh, without anybody uh, going up against his, his way, his decisions, his way of ruling. But now we had a woman in command. So here it became a bit more complicated. And what did the populace think of her? Well, um, from the documents that I looked through, um, we had two, two, two people who, who wrote about these moments. Uh, a man who called himself Hugh Falcanto, who's one, who wrote one of the main chronicles during the, the uh, regency of Queen Margaret. And then another man who was a bishop, his name was Romald of Salerno. Romald, not so much, but uh, Hugh, Hugh Falcando was not too nice towards Margaret. Okay, But uh, besides these two chronicles, we also have the reactions of people during different moments. And I, I find it interesting reading about the Muslim population of Palermo. They were the merchants. And the merchants were some of the, who were Muslims, of course, there were also more Jewish merchants, but they were the people who had more problems with, with the baronage of Sicily and Southern Italy, because think of it, a baron, a, a knight, in his case, it, it was clear what value his land had, how, how many taxes they owed the king or queen. But with a merchant, it was a little bit different. Merchants made loads of money, um, they weren't as rich as, as the knights and barons, but it was easier for them maybe to hide some of that money and not get a tax. Okay? I think it happens today, too. Somewhat. Some things don't change. <laughs> anyway, the Muslims seem to always have supported Queen Margaret in many situations. It was the case in which the bishop, the archbishop of Agrigento, 
tried to get the Muslims against the queen and um, he was trying to pay them off so that they could go and protest and, and rebel against the queen. And instead, the, the Muslims sent an envoy to Palermo uh, from Agrigento telling the queen what was going on and what this bishop was doing. Okay. You know, they didn't betray her. And, mm -hmm. and so I find this very interesting. Right. So the people supported her, but the religious leaders and the barons, they were not supportive. Yeah, they always found, tried to find a way uh, to go up against her, making up stories also of her having affairs with some people. For example, there was the case of, um, during her regency, some of her kingsmen came here to Sicily. Some of them really tried to give her support. Uh, for example, Stephen of Perish. Wow. Uh, others, like her half-brother, Rodrigo, uh, was actually trying to take command. And in the case of Stephen of Perish, who was her relative on her mother's side, so Norman French, Stephen of Perish, Margaret made him her chancellor. And, and so he was like second in command after her, after the queen. And then she made the mistake of appointing him Archbishop of Palermo. Uh-oh, so there you have two political soft spots right there. <laughs> exactly, the soft spots. So already before he was appointed Archbishop of Palermo, people at court uh, started to say, oh, look at Margaret, look at the queen, look at how she's eyeing her cousin, she's having an affair with him. Uh, it was probably not true. Okay, she probably looked at him as uh, a brother or somebody who could really give political and administrative support. In the end, she it, it got so wild that she ended up having to send him away. Right. It's just so sad to think you can't trust anyone when you're in such a position. I'm sure it happens to men too, but in, it, it, in this case, it, it really got complicated. <laughs> right. So... Stephen of Parish gets sent away, and this story doesn't end. What happens? Who becomes Archbishop then? Ah, okay. And there was a man who was uh, the tutor of young William II, Margaret's son. His name was Walter. He's referred to as Walter of Familius, uh, because eventually he had become a familiaris, which was this title that was used in Sicily for people at court uh, who had, who were like counselors, chancellors, or special uh, personal advisors of the king or queen. So Walter uh, was also the chaplain of the Palatine Chapel, but he was crazed with power. And on and off, he kept on trying to convince Queen Margaret, especially after she sent her cousin Steve, Stephen of Parish away, uh, he wanted the position as the um, highest prelate of the of the kingdom of Sicily, and that meant Archbishop of Palermo. They didn't like each other. She didn't like him. He didn't like her. But in the end, she looked around and she had no other choice. She chose Walter as Archbishop of Palermo. When in at the end of 1171, her son William II became king. Uh, William II found himself with Archbishop Walter, who was even more crazed with power. And he was pushing the young king, who was just 17, to finance his new project, rebuilding Palermo Cathedral. Mm, of course. Palermo mm. Cathedral probably did need to be rebuilt because it had been a mosque, then it had been turned into a church under the Normans. So it, it needed a restyling, restructuring. But young William had something else in his mind, his dream project, Montreale. Montreale Cathedral, Montreale Abbey. Um, he, had, he had lived as a child, a young, a young man, a teenager. He had seen his mother, Margaret, um, financing all kinds of projects, church projects, convents, monasteries that were founded by her all over Sicily, especially in the Nebrodi Mountains and around Palermo. And so his dream project was Montreale, and it was also a way to prove his worth, to prove his power, as opposed to Archbishop Walter. Uh, remind you, um, in Sicily, the Normans had something called apostolic legateship, which meant that they had been originally uh, under King Roger II, the Pope had bestowed upon the Norman kings and eventually queens the power to appoint their own bishops and archbishops. Anyway, so 
William wanted to prove that he was still powerful, that he had that power in his hands. And with the founding of Morreale Cathedral, right away, as the church was being built, he appointed a brand new bishop there in a place where there had never been a bishop. Had never been a bishop, but also, I mean, how many people were actually living in Montreal at the time? Uh, there was no town there before the town of Montreal was founded. There was uh, a farming area, um, but the land that then became the diocese of Montreal included many small rural towns. Many of them were governed by Muslims, places like uh, Yato, San Giuseppe Yato, Corleone, uh, these were towns with a prevalent Muslim population. And, and the Normans, later even Frederick II, until the Muslims got out of hand in Sicily because they wanted even more power, uh, and then at that point he, he asked them to leave the island. He didn't kill them, he just asked them to leave, and they did. But the, the Muslims at that time were able to, to govern their own towns uh, under the king or queen. So these towns became part of the diocese of Montreale under William II. So you could imagine what this must have caused in the mind of Archbishop Walter. <laughs> so this legend that we're told where William II was hunting and he fell asleep under a tree and then he dreamed the Madonna came to him and told him to build a cathedral on this spot, that's not true? <laughs> Do you still believe in Santa Claus, Allison? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I never did. Maybe when I was four. So so the, the bottom line is the behind the scenes story is that Montreal Cathedral was built as a big power play. Yeah, absolutely. It was a power play. Absolutely. <laughs> and Margaret was alive to see it all happen. Mm. She didn't she didn't die until eleven eighty three. By then the cathedral was standing and they were just completing the mosaics and the decorations. Wow. So she, she was, I could imagine her supporting her son, giving her advice. I mean, she always stayed like a step or two behind her son once he became, he actually took power when, when he reached the age of majority. But she was still there. In fact, she's buried at Montreal Cathedral. Hmm. Let's talk about her influence on other people. For example, other women who may have been at court when she was queen regent? Well, uh, first person who comes to mind is the future queen Constance, Roger's daughter. Roger II uh, married a few times and because he was widowed by his last wife, uh, Beatrice Arethel. He had a daughter who was born seven months after he died at the end of 1154. And that's Constance. Now, at that point, Margaret was already married. She already had had uh, two, two of her four children uh, by her husband, William I. When Constance was born, she, you know, she was as, as old as her, without a, what were they? Uh, she was the aunt of, people like William II of Margaret's children, but she was younger <laughs> than, than William II. Okay, but nonetheless, she, she, we could imagine her being influenced at least a bit by Margaret and her decisions, because um, then Constance, many years later, went on to become Queen Regnant and until the birth of her son, Frederick II. Right. One of the most important rulers in European history, not just Italian or Sicilian history, the Stupermundi. Stupermundi, yeah. the wonder of the world. <laughs> yes. So what would you say is her most significant legacy? Well, Montreale, the Cathedral of Montreale. I mean, I know that she didn't sign it with her name, but she was there from the beginning of the construction of the cathedral in 1174 until she died in 1183. The cathedral was complete the way we see it more or less by 1189. And it's, that, it's not just because of the fact that she's buried there, but a close friend of hers is portrayed in the apse, mm -hmm. his icon. And I'm talking about Archbishop Thomas Beckett, who was canonized in 1173 just three years after he was killed. And what's the connection? Uh, I said that he was um, a family friend on her mother's side, but 
What I didn't mention is that when Thomas Beckett had to flee England because of his issues with his ex-friend and then enemy, Henry II, even his king's men had to flee England. And guess what? Guess who gave them hospitality? Queen Margaret at court when she was regent. In fact, many years later, a church dedicated to Thomas Beckett was built near the cathedral where Thomas Beckett's relatives had stayed. So when Thomas Beckett was murdered, in, it, was, it was just a few years before Moriali Cathedral was built. So the icon that we see in the apse, just below the beautiful Pantocrator, the mosaic of Jesus, um, of Thomas Beckett is considered to be the earliest known public portrait of Thomas Beckett anywhere. Okay, I've been to Canterbury Cathedral. There's nothing as old as that portraying what he looked like to the public. That was her, her, her biggest achievement, um, uh, giving support to her son, giving him advice, and maybe some ideas also as to how that cathedral had to uh, be built. We only have one image of Margaret, and you found it at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And you put it on the cover of your book, right? Yes. When I went to New York a few years ago, I found this image. It's a pendant. Um, it's about two inches high, an inch and a half wide in gold. And it had a relic of Thomas Beckett inside. There's her image and that of a bishop blessing her. So yes, this, this is all that we know that she was slim and pretty, even at the age of 40. Mm -hmm. Well, come on, 40 is not that old. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> back then though, <laughs> she probably had, we don't know if she had dark hair or maybe medium brown hair because her mother was Norman, her father was Spanish. And we don't know much about her, no. Why was this pendant created? It was given to her as a gift when Joanna uh, married her son, William II. It was sent by Eleanor and Henry II as a gift to the Queen of Sicily because of her friendship with Thomas Beckett. Wow. Thomas Beckett was uh, really revered as a, a, a saint and a martyr here. There's even a cathedral, the Cathedral of Marsala is dedicated to Thomas Beckett and it was started the same year that Moriale Cathedral was built. Jacqueline Alio was born and raised in California by Sicilian parents who never severed their connection with their beloved island. As a child, she traveled to Sicily often and developed a significant bond with her ancestral homeland and relatives. Eventually, Jacqueline and her family decided to resettle in Sicily, where she completed her studies. Possessing a profound passion for the region, she chose careers that enable her to promote the history and traditions of the former kingdom. Jacqueline lectures frequently on the island's profound history, food and wine culture, and people with a focus on women. Jacqueline Alio's books, including Margaret Queen of Sicily, are available at major booksellers. Thank you for joining me for On Sicily. This is Alison Scola. Please visit experiencesicily.com for more On Sicily.